pitch to the plate. He has smacked the same spot. It is... No, the home run by Frank Robinson. He could paint a picture with words. Coming up into fourth position by Tim Tam, the favorite. Transport you to the center of the action. A gridiron rivalry that carries with it... When you listen to Claude Sullivan call a game, it was as if you had the best seat in the house. Francis Saunders, here's the captain Don Mills, under the basket, Cox plays it in. Johnny Cox gets his 10th field goal. He leads Elgin Baylor. He was the voice of the Kentucky Wildcats. Claude really knew the players very well and visited with the players and uh, could recognize them a lot of times without me as a spotter pointing out who they were because he, he knew their characteristics by being around them so much. He, he did his homework, he came to practices, he, he uh, talked to the coaches, talked to Coach Rupp and, and Coach Bryant and others, and he, he knew what he was about. His credentials were, were, were just unbelievable. For a young man, he was a young man, he was 27 when I came to the university. You know, some of our guys were 22, 23, but they were, and probably when he started, he was only a year or two older than, than the players. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is hard Claude Sullivan was a versatile and dedicated sportscaster. A visit to the archives will reveal clips from UK's football victory over Tennessee in 1953, which was Bear Bryant's last year in Lexington. Eight seconds to go. Has Kentucky beaten Tennessee? Have they? They sure have. The victory by Adolph Rupp's basketball team in the final game of the 1958 NCAA tournament. Takes the last shot of the ball game. No good. And the pay boy. The national champion, Kentucky Wildcats! A win by the U.S. basketball team in the 1960 Olympic Games in Rome. We're seeing the United States basketball team, an all-star group, appearing in Olympic competition for the first time in the 17th Olympiad. A call of Tim Tam's victory in the 1958 Bluegrass Stakes. He's up in there to third, Tim Tam to the outside to second. Tim Tam's coming on top, at to finish it, close later in Tim Tam. Fit in very tightly. And a home run by the Reds' Frank Robinson during the 1965 season. And here's Frank Robinson. He walked in the first and homered in the fourth. So officially, Robbie is one for one, batting 323. Claude was, uh, was he's an icon, and uh, he, he, he worked at his trade. And, uh, and people that heard him, they with any imagination, they can imagine that they were at Stahl Field or, or Memorial Coliseum or any place in the South. Claude uh, traveled with the team back in those days. He was part of the team. And um, um, when we went around to the, sh the shoot around, was he, he was there uh, on the day of the game or we got there uh, the day before, he, he was always with us. Claude was on the radio saying, um, one second left, uh, one second to go. Now the crowd had waited all the game and it won overtime, and now they're leaving. And uh, he said, it could be the most exciting play of the season, you know. This could be the most thrilling play of the season, you know. This time, John Krigler will put the ball in play for Kentucky. Ed Beck's under the basket, one second to go. Pass to Hatton from 35 feet, it's good! And then uh, we had uh, two more overtimes, and we won, uh, beat them at uh, two points. In a career that was tragically cut short by cancer, Claude Sullivan had become an iconic figure. At the time of his death in 1967, Sullivan was the play-by-play -play man for both the Cincinnati Reds and the Kentucky Wildcats football and men's basketball teams. In 2005, Claude Sullivan was inducted into the Kentucky Journalism Hall of Fame and in 2006 into the UK Sports Hall of Fame. His legacy endures today through his influence on the careers of other successful sportscasters such as Kay Wood Ledford, Tom Hammond, Al Michaels and Marty Brenham. So I think probably the, the people that came along later, Kay Wood, and, and uh, at that time, uh, J.B. Falconer was, was also doing uh, broadcasts. Uh, Earl Boardman came in, as I recall, but uh, I, think, I think Claude was kind of, he was kind of the model, as, as, as I think back. 
called the football games for Kentucky and the basketball. Then he went on and did the Cincinnati baseball, a three-letter a three man. You know, they were hard to find, especially in the broadcasting business. I kind of learned a lot from him just listening to him. He would describe the audience uh, as much as you'd like to be there, and, uh, and he uh, would talk about the players uh, individually and uh, uh, even the players that, uh, on the opposition team. He, he knew all their traits and what they were doing and uh, uh, the coaches of the other teams, he described them and uh, he knew you know, what to uh, tell about uh, each one of them having different uh, uh, secrets that they do and all that. Uh, he, could, he could really paint a picture and if you were familiar with uh, Old Stall Field, then he could he could really paint a picture of and and the scene for that particular game. Good afternoon, football fans everywhere from Stall Field on the campus of the University of Kentucky in Lexington, where the skies are perfectly clear with not a cloud in sight. Brilliant, sunshiny day. I remember reading somewhere that the some airline pilot talked about you could always tell when Kentucky was playing because as they flew across Kentucky every night would be on in every home listening to the Wildcats and and most of those people were listening to Claude Sullivan. The Wildcats are the defending champions. Why Jones runs up and takes the ball away from Pilgrim. He wants that ball for his own. He grabs it and boy do they deserve it. The Wildcats have made a tremendous demonstration. Alex Rosa, the captain of the Kentucky Wildcats, has walked away with a trophy for the second.